Okay. So a ton of people are interested in streaming real-time uh, workloads and iceberg together. Uh, and this talk is going to be uh, exactly about that, um, to see how you can stream uh, really fast with Iceberg, but without breaking your lake house. Um, so briefly about myself, I'm Yuval, the CTO at Thrift. We build a managed Iceberg solution that automates optimizations and things like that. So first of all, how can you even stream today with Iceberg? Um, so actually, the number of tools available are uh, becoming um, larger and larger. So if we look at um, basically from since inception at Netflix, we basically started just with Spark um, and Spark streaming. But then very quickly, a lot of tools joined uh, the streaming party um, with Flink, Trino, and Kafka adding their support, each one with their own uh, implementation. And then quickly catching up are more vendors. So Amazon Kinesis, Fivetran, Rising Wave. And actually, there's a ton of, there's a new tool every day right now that can stream into Iceberg. Um, so the tooling is there. The question is now, what do you need to do to make it work? Um, so just a recap of what happens behind the scenes when you actually stream to Iceberg. Uh, we're going to talk about append only and, uh, mer and merges and deletes. So when you, you do append only, and specifically, as Foco mentioned before, uh, when you do fast appends, you basically get these um, snapshots, manifest list, and manifest created in each micro batch of streaming. So imagine you're streaming every 30 seconds, every, uh, every minute, you get all of these files created. Basically, again, every minute, every uh, column here is, an, is a different snapshot. And you can imagine tens of thousands of these created uh, very quickly when you stream into Iceberg. Um, things get even more complicated if you do things like merges, CDC. Um, so not only you're creating so many metadata files, you're also starting to point into uh, deletion files, deletion vectors in V3, um, and so forth. And really, the, the, the first decision you have to do when you're streaming into Iceberg is, are you going to do copy and write or merge and read? And this is quite critical when you're choosing that strategy. Um, so very quickly, copy and write will copy and replace the entire file on each um, update. So when you, if your streaming job looks like this, and you have a merge that matches a data file, you're basically going to replace the data file and write it again. If you do merge on, uh, on read, you're going to write some kind of a delete file, maybe a, a deletion vector um, next to this data file, and then deal with that later. You can deal with that either with asynchronous compaction or just with the query engine uh, merging those files together. Um, and really, the trade-off here is the streaming latency. So you can imagine if you're using merge on read, you have a much, much lower um, streaming latency, uh, but you have work to do later on, um, either in compaction or either in, in query time. Um, OK, so after we chose the writing strategy, um, we are left with a few really, really painful challenges. I'm going to talk about three today. Small files, planning latency, and active storage, uh, which are the most common challenges with, with streaming today. So let's start with understanding them. So small files, I'm sure everyone heard the term or, or really know it. It's really easy to explain. Basically, when you stream, you end up with tons and tons of, diff of different small files. And they could be large files, they can be small files. But at the end of the day, when you take a query engine and let it read it, it hits the object storage a lot of, the, a lot of times, basically as many times as you have files. Um, and that can cause um, cost, performance hits, um, and basically, a lot of trickling down effects to all every system that works with those files. So we imagine you have a Spark job reading for, from this uh, lake house over here. Um, every Spark task is assigned to a, a group of files here. So we end up with a ton of um, Spark tasks just because you have a lot of files, uh, which ends up with a lot of memory, and so on and so forth. The next problem is the planning latency. So the same way as we have a lot of different data files, we also have a lot of manifest, especially in fast appends. And when the query engine, when you, when you hit select start from, the query engine goes to the metadata of Iceberg, hits all of those manifests, and searches for min, max, and null values to start pruning the data files. And usually this process is done to accelerate the query to make sure you're pruning data, you're, you're querying really fast. But when you're streaming and leaving all of these files behind, um, 
you basically have a very, very long planning latency. So you're going to do select star from, suddenly you're going you're gonna to get a loading or a hanging situation without even reading any file because you're traversing all of those manifests, trying to understand which are relevant, um, and only then starting to scan and read file. Um, so high planning latency is also a challenge with, with streaming workloads. And the last one, which is actually pretty interesting, uh, is what we call an active storage. Now you can define an active storage with the, um, the size of the current snapshot in the table, which really is your data. The, the only data that is interesting, the only data that is accessible to your users by default, compared to the size of all the tracked snapshots you have in Iceberg, okay? which can be much, much um, higher than that. Or even you can go you can go farther and say it's not only the amount of total um, snapshots it's actually everything you have in the bucket which can even be larger if you're not cleaning orphans and things like that now in streaming this becomes very painful so let's see uh, uh, an example um, so you can see i stream data files they're one megabyte each and the green rectangles are actually data files that I've compacted along the way. So I started with two files of one megabyte files, and then I compacted them into a two megabyte file, I write another one, and so on and so forth. So now if we look at the active storage, or more directly, how much am I paying to AWS on S3, as opposed to how much data do I actually have? And you want this to be uh, close to each other. But in this example, you can see I have basically four megabytes stored in my latest snapshot. But if you look at the entire tree of iceberg, you can see I have nine megabytes stored here. Now this example is super small, but imagine switching the megabytes into terabytes or petabytes, and that results with hundreds of thousands of dollars paying for data that can never be accessed other than um, history and things like that. Um, and that creates a very low active storage, so a 44% of active storage. Um, and you really want to aim for something much higher. And the thing is that with streaming workloads, this is, this is amplified because this happens every few seconds, every few minutes. And suddenly when you're choosing the snapshot expiration configuration, it's not simple as let's have uh, seven days of snapshots history to retain because th those seven days translates to hundreds of thousands of these uh, data files that are being retained. So in streaming situations, it's not a matter of how many days I want to save back. It's actually a matter of, can I keep my active storage in a kind of uh, a way that works for me in terms of how much am I paying? Now, how do we remediate uh, some of those? Let's talk about compaction. Um, so everyone here knows what's compaction. This, the, the concept is, is very simple, right? You take a bunch of files, uh, they're small at the beginning, you combine them together, now they're larger and the query engine is happier. Now, compaction is one of those problems that is, seems very simple, but then gets really, really complicated when you get into real world scenarios which are different than this, and especially in streaming, because in streaming, again, you create all of this tail of, uh, of data files. So how do you compact when streaming? So I think the... My main, my main thing I would like you to take from, that, from this uh, session is that you need to actually measure compaction. Compaction is not something you either have turned on or turned off. It could be uh, configured into a lot of different ways. So if we measure compaction, we can measure it on two axes. First is how much does it cost for me? Um, I can do compaction uh, very often with a lot of resources um, or the other way around if I want to save money. And the other axis is I want to minimize the number of small files that I'm reading, okay? And the most simple example to, to think about it is if you have a table that no one queries, then the number of small files that are being read is, is not that high, right? So it means that you should not pay a lot of money to compact this table. And you can imagine all of these different scenarios in your lake house that ha are happening where you want to compact other, some stuff better than others. Now, let's see how this axis actually compare in real life. So in this example, we have, again, 10 data files of one megabyte each. Um, and we have two compaction algorithms over here, and quite simple, just to demonstrate the difference in, in measuring. In this algorithm, we wait until we gather 10 files of one megabyte, and we compact them together into one big file of, of 10 megabytes. 
if we look at the number of bytes that we compacted, let's say we did it with Spark, then we needed resources and time to compact 10 megabytes of, of, uh, of data, which makes sense, right? It's, it's the most simple way. Now imagine a different situation um, on this side. I'm not going to wait for 10 files to, create, to be created. I'm going to do it every two files because I'm streaming really fast and my users need really fast analytics on um, low SLA of, of data. So I'm doing it every two files. So two files become two megabyte and another file is joined and then it's three megabyte and four megabyte. And you can see how the number of bytes compacted is suddenly 44 megabytes, which is almost five times as the, uh, the first algorithm. So we have two compaction algorithms running, doing the same job. At the end of the day, they're going to have the same result, but one is 5x more data compacted than the other one, which means basically it can cost 5x more um, and have a lot of different aspects to it. So this is why you need to really measure compaction and understand which one of those do you want to pay more to have a lower SLA or pay less to have uh, a very low resources compaction uh, be running on your lake house. Um, some more considerations for compactions. Basically, when you think about compaction, you have to think about two or three things. So the first one is when to compact. Second is what to compact. And actually, a third one, which we're not going to cover here, is how to compact. Um, so when to compact, there is a ton of different strategies available. Um, you can do it based on commits, based on files. You can do it a time-based um, uh, compaction. Uh, you need to think when you're doing time-based, you need to think, am I conflicting with another writer? So think about streaming situations where the writer writes every 30 seconds. You have a question of when can I kind of come into that process and compact without doing too many conflicts uh, along the way. Um, and actually, my favorite is when not to run compaction. Okay, everyone wants to run compaction, but actually the, the, one of the smart things you can do is decide when not to run compaction. Is this table unused? Um, maybe it's the night time. Maybe it's the weekend. Maybe there are other tables that are more important. And that brings me to the second part, which is what to compact. And you can prioritize different tables, which makes sense, but you can actually prioritize different partitions. So imagine a time-based uh, workload where you have even late arriving data. So data arrives chronologically, but some, suddenly you have data from the past coming in. Um, the question is, what do you need to prioritize first? Which partitions do you care more uh, and you want to compact so your users uh, are enjoying a very fast uh, latency? Um, and if your users are querying the last week or the last month and uh, they don't query as much the, the data that is seven years old, for example, maybe it's not that important to run compaction on the last seven years of data. Um, so having... Uh, analyzing partitioning and the access patterns can help you in this, to decide what to compact in terms of which partitions do I want optimized and which are not. And Iceberg lets us the flexibility of choosing, um, choosing this and choosing that. Um, and again, for, for snapshot retention, as I said before, uh, the last thing you want to do is actually choose it by a day that, uh, for example, a week or two weeks that you want to go back in history because you, you want to make sure you multiply that by the streaming interval that you're using because two weeks of 10 seconds each results with a lot of um, data files, which results with very, very low uh, active storage and which hurts your wallet, basically. So main takeaways from, from this talk. First of all, Iceberg and streaming are good friends and don't be afraid. Streaming with Iceberg is totally possible. You, we, can, we see it all over the, uh, the world now. Uh, with real-time uh, query engine starting to support it, um, and it really, really works well. Um, however, a few things to take into consideration. Measure your compaction, because compaction becomes really, really hard in streaming, because you need to work hard. So you want to measure that uh, your money is being spent uh, in a proper way. You want to analyze um, your metadata, so understanding how many data files and how many manifests you currently have in each partition, and, and make decisions according to that. And you want to aim to more than 85% of active storage uh, to be in the same position, uh, because usually in streaming situation, we see that being much, much lower, as you saw in the example, 44%, or in some actual production use cases, we saw even less than 10%, uh, which is quite horrible. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>